Hey, what's up, YouTube? Welcome to Play It Painted Live. Time for another live stream. We are gonna rock this, yo. We got <clears throat> got another crunch project here. Uh, so tonight we're gonna be working on Tater, as you can see here. So I'll break him out in a second. Because what we got to do right now, we have a time critical step here. We're gonna have to make a scenic base for Tater. So I'm gonna use that bad boy right there. Right, rod. We're gonna make just enough two-part epoxy putty, just enough, it's like a teeny tiny, like not even a pinch of it, like like nothing, like like that that much of part A. Like that's smaller than a kernel of corn, and this is still going to be too much material, honestly. Right? Should we get enough part B here? There's your part B. Woo! Sticking together! <clears throat> but we're going to do this real quick, okay? Part A, part B. I like to use these uh, Malifo, um bases for this because they're nice and flat and they're really easy to stamp. And you can get away with using a relatively small amount of putty, which is what I am doing right now. Okay, so we're going to mix this together with our fingers. So you, you want to do this part first because it takes uh, the putty a while to set up. So this is really, I mean, this, if we, if all goes right tonight, the putty will still be setting when the, the model itself is drying, which is kind of wild, but so anyways, so you can see I made about enough for a pea or maybe, maybe more like a kernel of corn. That's about right. So, so now I'm going to spread that. Ooh, yeah, I don't know. I just barely made enough. For this to work, that's an awful thin, awful thin uh, piece there. But I trust me, this should work, right? <laughs> okay, so now we're going to get our base stamp. And since this is farmers, we're going to go with forest floor, right? And then we're going to, oh shoot. And put my wet palette away for a second here. <clears throat> if you're just joining us, welcome to Play It Painted Live. Let us know what you're painting, what you should be painting. We are working on Tater tonight. So, put a little water here on the base. And then we're going to take this bad boy. Rest nice and firm. All right. Get a nice... Print there, and there you go. You can see, nice and thin and good. So now that the time critical part is done, I'm gonna take my gloves off for a second, and we're gonna build the metal model. Okay. If I can get this. I wanna reuse these gloves during the airbrushing step, so. Do that. All right. Mr. Tater. There we go. Just shake out the fingers. Okay. So, Mr. Tater. So, normally I would actually, you know, use that base and just fill it in with, uh, with uh, plastic putty, but me. I don't really need that. We can refer to that as the uh, as the reference art there. So we'll probably refer to back to that from time to time. Here is Mr. Tater. You can see he's a two-piece model. Um, and it looks like this basically just goes like that. All right. 
and we gotta I really don't like metal pole arms because they have that issue let's go ahead and trim the bottom of so we're gonna trim this tab off wow that just came right off you hear that Boom! that was it hitting uh, hitting the one of the lights here okay and we'll file the feet flat so one of the advantages to stamping your base fresh while you're doing all this is uh, that it will fit you can press the feet into the base and it should fit nice and like there should be no floating toe like I, you get a lot of floating toe with uh, minis that you put on bases after the stamping has dried or if you're dealing with like you know resin bases or bases that have already you know that are already set quick check for mold lines it looks pretty good looks pretty good what's the, oh okay so there's actually this is kind of cool there's actually a secondary point here of attachment so it kind of attaches sorry I'm not in frame that attaches there and then the hand attaches there let me see if I can bend that to make it actually make everything fit properly right okay so I'm gonna file down the tiny little nub here so that I can run my pin through the hand. Okay. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, this is gonna be interesting. Okay. And let's get our pin vise out. We're gonna need two pins for this model. So get my guitar wire and I have no idea where that went now it's here somewhere We're going to get some music wire, clip that, and we're going to just clip a couple of pins out of this. So first pin, whoo, actually did fire into my finger through the cloth. That's crazy. Tiny little pin there. Second pin. I'm gonna make that a little bit bigger because it's <sighs> this one's gonna be for the foot. Okay. All right. So now we can we can do the pinning. So we're gonna pin the hand through right here through the hand let me know if you have any questions or anything boo You have a reasonable channel there for the pin. So let's glue that pin in.
There we go. Okay, so we're gonna let that dry, and then we're gonna drill the hole, the matching hole in the hand here. Doesn't seem to be grabbing much. There we go. Okay, I got it. Hope that works. <laughs> and then, so what I normally do for the foot pin is I will stand the model up and I look for which of the two feet is going to be flatter into the surface. That's when I want to run the pin through. Because sometimes the models, the way models are posed, um, one foot might not be set flat on the ground. And so you want to you want to pick the foot that's going to have the most contact with the base of the model. In this case, it's going to be the right foot. I'm going to feel this uh, bit starting to dull. That's going to be a problem. Okay. All right. And let's go ahead and put that pin in. Yeah, it's not sticking out much. I don't even know. There you go. You can see it on camera there. Okay. So now, uh, so now I want to put a little bit of glue in this channel here, and I'm going to put some glue here, there, and we're going to stick that hand in there. And hope. Fully and get that to line up with. We can get the the peg that's on the bottom of this pole to line up with the channel in the foot. Ooh. I do not like the way that that oh that the pole arm kind of arced there. Right. Right. There we go. Okay. So now that's done. So now this is barely set. This is going to be a little risky, but we are we are really crunched for time. The client wants this done by tomorrow. So I'm going to do, this is like typically way younger than I like to go on the base, but like I said, we may, we don't really have much of a choice here. Drill, and we're going to drill the hole all the way through the base. Oops, I even made a little little gash there with with the drill. And we're gonna go ahead and glue Mr. Tater here into the base. Now here's the interesting part. Um, because the base isn't set, I don't want to press the model down too hard into it, the base. I want it, I just want to make firm contact there, All right? So I'm, so I'm being a little bit more gentle with how this guy is going to fit together. Hey, what's up, Blade Wolf? Welcome to the feed. So I'm going to hold Tater together like that. <clears throat> and... 
and let's let him dry for a second. Hope he stands up straight. Let him dry for a second while I clean out, clean and prep the airbrush. <clears throat> now here we go. So normally what I all I really do, I'm gonna do a little bit. I, I want this, I need the uh, this to go pretty smoothly because I don't want to waste too much time here. So I normally clean out clean off the needle. So by to do that I just take a little water onto my towel and kind of drag draw the needle through it and clean the needle that way. Then I'll check the ferrule, see if the ferrule needs to be cleaned. So when I say ferrule, I'm talking about this piece right here. Hey, what's up, howdy? How do you like playing farmers? I did not end up playing the farmers. <laughs> uh, one of my friends and viewers here saw me painting the farmers and he was like, hey man, sell me your farmers <laughs> before the event started uh, because he wanted to get into Guild Ball. And you know, this is, uh, farmers are a great team to start the game with. So he wanted to, to start with the farmers. Uh, and so what I did was that team that I sped painted, I sold him that team. Uh, he went on to play the event and he won this tater from the event. Just a reminder that my ads block is turned on, so I'm not giving you a shitty fuck you, get wrecked, bitch. Cool. You know what? I don't have any ads on this channel. It's not monetized, punk. So you get wrecked. <laughs> Ain't no ads on this channel. What's the matter with you? Anyways, um, so yeah, so he won the tater, and now he wants to play tater, and we're gonna, uh, we're gonna get this guy painted, hopefully tonight, hopefully get him all done. So... Okay, so I'm just cleaning out the, so the other thing I do is I, I'll take the needle here and just kind of clean out this channel leading uh, out of the airbrush because uh, that helps. There's always like a little bit of solid back there that you want to clean. But yeah, so I have, I've still never played Farmers. Um, I have been across the table from them a couple of times now. Uh, they are pretty damn scary. To face against, uh, especially when you know they've got all those harvest markers out, and uh, they start to pick them up to try to wreck your face with it. That's where it gets pretty scary. So the last thing I'd like to do while this is uh, while that's drying is I like to clear out the cap. So I'll take a, an old like needle, or you could take like a dental pick or something. And just kind of get the solid out from behind the the cap. Because that's another place where commonly we'll get solid. <laughs> just joking, buddy. I'm so bored. <laughs> no worries. I do like to get wrecked, bitch, though. That was super bra. I like that. <laughs> anyway. Um, so clean that out. Put that guy back in. As you can see, I take such good care of my hairbrushes. <laughs> uh, but hey, they do the job. They do the job. It's all good. Honestly, these little $20 airbrushes last a long time. Like, I beat the crap out of these airbrushes. And uh, by the time they start going bad, 
because they're 20 bucks, it's cheaper to just replace the whole airbrush than it is to try to like replace it, uh, replace individual parts. So anyway, um, so there's that. And so we're just about ready to start priming this guy. Let's go ahead and stick him on here. I'm gonna move, I'm gonna pan up a little bit so that we can see what's going on. Ooh. I'm already kind of messing up the, the skull. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, we'll deal. It'll look fine. <laughs> anyway, get that there. And let's get our gloves back on. Kick the compressor on. And we'll do our prime. We'll block the, uh, we'll do our initial color blocking. I actually want to try to get, mo uh, you know, the main, kind of the cream and the green color blocked out. So, and the, and the, uh, going to do a little lighting effect on the weapon. On the sickle, I should say. And uh, that way there's the, the actual painting shouldn't be too tedious, right? Can I get the thumb out on this particular glove? There we go. Oh, man. Ah! All right, so here we go. You, you didn't think tonight you'd spend this time watching or listening to me struggle to put a rubber glove on, right? That was riveting stuff as always on this uh, feed. Nice, got a good, that sounds pretty good. Run a little water through there, looks good. All right, so let's give this, this dude a prime. Mm -hmm. Break up that, that, that uh, putty is really wet. Let's see what happens here. Oh shoot. Oh, so much for that shirt. Oh, okay. Oh, man. We knew that was coming. So he, he got glued. He glued. He got glued to the... to the epoxy. And not... I guess the pin didn't... Oh, the pin did make it through the base, but what a what a terrible mess. Okay. Okay. So we're gonna have to we're gonna have to fix this this way. Oh no, pin is not just not biting through there. Hold on. Oh, boy. What a mess, guys. The pin bent, that's why. Let's try that again. Where's the hole? Let's 
I'm just going to drill a hole through there. I think, I think I went way too fast. <laughs> okay. That's what happens, man. I need it by tomorrow. Well, well, that's a problem. This, if this doesn't work, I'm going to have to use a prefab uh, uh, base. In fact, why don't I do that? Why don't I try to find one while this is setting? All right. There's always another way, guys. Always another route we can take. I mean, it's a pretty generic basing scheme. I could even do something like that. That would be fine. You know, I'll just do that. I'm afraid this is going to fall off again. Yeah, that's totally going to fall off again. So we're just, we're going to start over here and pull. Clean that off. Yeah, it's just, it, it usually takes, for this putty, usually takes a while for it to dry. That base, unfortunately, is going to be ruined unless I scrape it clean, which I can do. All right. Okay. What a mess. Let's pull that pin out. Because it's, there we go. I actually need a longer pin, so I'm going to cut myself a longer pin to use here. The good part about using that like raised one is I can now use a pretty big pin to do this. And that's kind of what I need to do here. Just stick a big pin on there, like that big. And that should be pretty good. Meanwhile, all that epoxy is starting to dry. Wow, we really are in trouble, aren't we? Okay, so let's put that, let's glue the pin back in here. There we go. And then, uh, so I'm going to stick. So he's going to be, Tater's going to have a little bit more of a, kind of a rougher scenic base to him than the other farmers. And he's going to have a little bit of water running on his base. So he'll, he'll have a little bit, a little bit more painting to do here, but at least it will. I mean, I could try to put it back in. This is starting to. That is starting to dry. 
I don't know, should I risk it? That looks like that would work, actually. Let's risk it. Because this is a much better base. In the long run, this is going to be a better looking model. If it could just keep it together. Right? If I can make sure I glue it properly. And stick it on here. Yeah, rather than waste the base that I just barely started. Okay. Pretty wild. Just kind of expect trying to hope things all kind of dry around the same time. Tater. Is this the Gen Con Mini? I think Tater was a Gen Con Mini two years ago. Well, I don't think he was this year's Gen Con. This year's Gen Con Minis were the chibi models, I believe. Okay. Welcome to the show, Albert. Okay, so now we are back in business. That was a, quite a little operation I had to do there to fix that. But, you know, worth it. This is tater, people. All right. Let's go with gray. Should really get with the times. <laughs> Okay, so now a little gray. hit it with a little bit of white and then we'll start the color block okay and a little bit of white this is a commission or are you diving into farm country uh, this is a commission actually this is the guy who won the uh, that won this miniature last night asked me kind of begged me to paint it <laughs> because he is also the guy that bought the Farmer's Guild that I painted a couple nights ago. So how convenient that he wins the Tater and now wants the Tater to be painted to the same standard that the rest of the farmers are.
And if you accuse me of rigging it so that I did get a second commission out of that, I don't blame you. It looks bad. Okay, so now uh, we're going to start rounding up our colors that we need to uh, we need to block this character with. I'm going to get my pin vise out of there, too. <laughs> Whatever, more money for you. There's that, um, and then there's also what I really like about being able to do that for locals is it encourages them to continue playing, right? Because, you know, I like these games and I do like, you know, making a bit of money off my hobby, but I also really like the fact that as I'm doing it, that, you know, people get more into, the people that aren't painting get more into the game too, because it's like, oh, well, now I have my team, my team is painted up, I got another thing for my team. We painted that up too. Yeah, we got uh, it. It was pretty cool last night. We got uh, two new players into Guild Ball and lots of other folks that are you know right on the fence right now that may hop in at a at a later time, but we'll see. Uh, and then conversely, what was really the other thing that was kind of cool about last night was. Um, the folks that that already are already into guild ball saw batman cuz i set up a batman table too and we had some people playing batman and so it was like oh so the guild ball players were looking at batman the other players were looking at guild ball so that all works and it's a that's a nice pairing of games honestly is guild ball and batman um, there's oddly more similarities in those games than i than I would have uh, initially thought. Well, they work well together. Yes, yeah, sneaky. See how it all kind of plays together? It's like, oh, well, I play, I play this game, and, you know, and we set out another game for them to like, and then they like that game, too. <laughs> all right. Uh, so let's go with this kind of a foresty green color. And that's... You know, what did I do though? I if he should match he should match the rest of the guild. He shouldn't be green. I'll use I'll save that forest green for the uh actually no let's use let's just shoot a quick shot of it right now onto the base. But that's not this foresty green is not a color that uh that I used on the farmers. They need to match. So I'll find the brown that I used for the farmers. Should all be pretty close. I mean, that was only a couple nights ago. Right now, let's get this green down here. that out all right so let's see in terms of the colors I used last night aged white was one of them and there was this medium brown that I used definitely used this let's just get all these colors out so we used most of these okay and then that's pretty good. I think there was another. Was there another brown that I used? I don't think so. Oh, here we go. Light brown. Okay. So let's go ahead. So we, we're going to start with this camo medium brown on the bottom part of the, the pantalones. Okay. 
Ooh, hold on. Got a little bit of green left over in there. But yeah, you know, the event last night was super fun. I broke out my waifu union list, and we had a new, we have a new player in from who, who's not new to Guild Ball, but he's new to our area, and he, he moved here from uh, Colorado, and he came down to check out the event, wanted to get some Guild Ball in. He plays Hunters, and man, that guy just trashed my union squad. It was kind of pathetic kind of awesome at the same time. I guess I should try to... Uh, so this Hunter's Guild, pretty standard. Theron, Jaycar, uh, Cena, um, forget the cat's name. He took the general cat. Uh, he took uh, Minx, uh, which was a huge help. And I forgot what else he took. He did not take um, Egret. Yeah, pretty power team. It was pretty strong. Great game. I got shut out, but you know, I played I played my union team pretty poorly. It's been a while since I broke them out. And I just, you know, I just did not do a great job. Also, I didn't, you know, I didn't really have the dice helping me out either. That's okay. That that happens. Like you gotta just bear that. Okay. So there's that. So now we do the, uh, we're gonna do some of this uh, light brown and then finally some aged white. Whoa. My age, my light brown is doing weird stuff. Whoa, way too much. I guess I had a clog in there. This is, this is going to be bad. I need to stick a little bit of airbrush thinner in there. And that's going to clog my airbrush. Actually, a little worried about sticking that in there. There we go. Just pull the solid out of it. Should be okay now. Okay. Let's try. All right, so. Did you get your blacksmith guild yet? No, I've not. I mean, it, I, it was on pre-order, um, and then according to the according to the website, it said you know estimated shipping date would be like November thirteenth or something crazy, and I was like, really? Um, it could be because of some other stuff I placed on that order. Um, you know, like pundits have. Um,
get access to things like organized play kits and stuff, and I actually ordered an organized play kit. So it might be due to that, but I don't know. Between painting my hunters and my girlfriend's farmer, it's been a lot of work. Oh, I believe it. Okay, so finally we're going to do some aged white. And then I think we're actually ready to start painting. Like the mystery box. Yeah, uh, I, have, I have a weird issue with my mystery box too. Because I ordered a mystery box and it showed up on my PayPal. But it's not in my order history on my account. So I sent Steamforge an email kind of asking them, hey, what gives? And they uh, they have not answered that. I'm just gonna hit the hair with a little bit of color too while I'm at it. So there we go. Looks like he's, for the most part, blocked. Doing pretty good. Oh, you were kidding me. Yeah, I had, I had uh, talked myself out of getting it. And then I don't know what the hell happened. I think I, what happened was I talked myself out of getting it during the first round of orders. And I thought I had made it. You know, I was in the clear. I was like, okay, 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 right? And then, and then the weirdest thing happened. They they decided to re-offer it. They're like, oh, you know, it sold so well, we're gonna restock it. So they restocked it. And then I was like, you know what? Let's just gamble. It's fine. It's seventy bucks. If I don't like it, I can paint and sell, or you know, I can even include it as. I can include one of the teams as an extra life raffle. So we'll see. With your airbrush, how much paint to water flow do you need? It depends. If you get a team you don't want from it, let me know. Oh, for sure. Just so you know, uh, you're not the first person to give me that offer, too. There are other people that are like, you know, I'd be interested in, in buying one of the teams, if, you know, depending on what I got. So um, so there is one other person that kind of has that deal open. So I guess what we're just going to have to see uh, what actually comes in, and then we'll kind of make a – I'll make a call regarding what I want to keep and what, uh, what I'd be willing to sell. So as re regard to thinning, so I use Vallejo Airbrush Thinner, um, and it's kind of hard to explain. I actually, it depends on the thickness of the paint that I'm thinning. You know, it ta this takes a little bit of experience. It takes a little bit of trial and error. Like, I, you can tell which paints are going to require more thinning um, than, than uh, as opposed to other paints. Um, and, you know, a good general rule for me is I usually go, uh, I usually go like two or three parts thinner to one part paint. Um, and that's, uh, that is thin enough generally to get me, um, through, uh, through a 0.2 needle and start to build color slowly. Cause that's what you want to do. Like you don't want to get big solid blocks of color out. That looks actually fantastic. That looks perfect for what I'm trying to do. There's, I mean, if we do this right, we're actually moving along pretty quick. I'm going to give that a second to dry while I set up my wet palette. So we're going to take a very, very quick cookie break. Where's my cookie? This is the bad part, like trying to have sugar, like having sugar while... Late at night. Not good for my diet, but I kind of need it for painting.
I mean, that is hard. It's a pretty simple model. Let's see how we do. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, I thin everything with that airbrush thinner. It's all usually about three to one. Okay, here's my actual brush. <laughs> so let's do. I actually have a lot of stuff to paint coming up because I have. Uh, I'm going to be making a demo kit for. Uh, Game Master, and I want to paint, so I want to paint some of those clowns for that. Just stuff I can leave at the shop in case anyone, you know, wanted to learn. Then the store staff can step in and they can, they can teach some Batman. Um, you know, because they, the, the store, the store manager asked me, you know, hey, can we, can we do some some Batman demos and try to get more people into the game? And if I'm being totally honest with you guys, um, I want to get more people into the game. And I'll I'd say most of the time I don't mind giving a demo, a game demo. The problem is, you know, with me, the long history of me doing that, and then kind of being the guy known for that. Um, was okay back in the day when I had, you know, when I could game reliably once or twice a week, uh, and I had a, a thriving community of players around me, and, you know, we could pick up the slack for each other, and, uh, you know, and we always had, um, and I was always able to get a good game if I wanted one, um, compared to now, where I have you know, I got two kids, and uh, the demands uh, to the demand to be home is uh, quite a bit more. I can't work the conventions that I used to work. My gaming time, you know, is very is very very precious. And so, if I'm if I'm you know just being transparent here, the thought of being the demo guy again for another system, right? Because I already Fund it for Guild Ball. I am, I'm already a ninja for a ninja division. Um, and even well, those responsibilities, are, I have a difficult time these days keeping up uh, to try to add Batman to that and be the, you know, the, the sidekick or the, the guy that, to promote Batman. That's way too much. That's, that's way too much on my plate. And uh, honestly, I don't want to be... I already get a lot of um, I already get a lot of requests from the shop owners to do public events, paint days, demo days, and all that kind of stuff. And again, don't get me wrong, I enjoy all of that stuff. But the time has kind of come for me to just to just try to just be a player, you know, try to just enjoy the games with my friends and you know that's not to say I won't help like I want to do my part I help fund things like even as a pundit even when I, I can't run um, a lot of like regular in-store events I just don't have that capacity to do that um, I still um, assist by promoting things online I still have you know I was the guy that put together the SoCal pundit kit um, and so I still contribute, you know, in, in my own way, I guess. I still contribute that way. Um, in terms of Ninja Division, it's similar. You know, I still contribute to kind of an overall picture for Ninja. It's been a while since I've logged any sort of 
demo activity with them. I was kind of banking on uh, AX really being my peak activity with Ninja this year. Um, but yeah. The bang they previewed the bang I want. Me too. Yeah, I think people that have been with me, um, you know, at least for a year or more, kind of see where I was, they kind of saw where I was headed anyway. They kind of saw that, you know, the the days of being kind of the guy that that did all this, um, you know, gaming promotion and, and that kind of stuff, that those days were coming to an end. So I think I think you're right. I think the people that have been around get it. Um, I've had to explain that to to some of the the people at Game Master because you know they don't know me. They don't they don't know kind of my long history there. And I don't you know. And I want to help them. I want to help their store. I enjoy being there. I enjoy what they do for us, but at the same time, you know, I need to, I need to be clear with them. Like, look, I can't, there are things I I'm capable of helping with. And then there's things that I can't help with currently. Uh, so when they asked me to, to run game demos for Batman, I said, you know what? I will do it on one condition. I need, I need, a store staff to learn how to do the how to demo the game. You know what I mean? I need to get I need to get buy-in from the staff. I need to know that it's not my responsibility of if like two nine year olds walk in the store and they want to learn how to play Batman because it looks cool. And you know they're gonna they wanna you know they want to take a two or three hour demo and that would be my gaming evening. Like that's not fair. Um, it, it, uh, it, it, I used to be able to do stuff like that before. Like I used to just take it on the chin and go, you know, I, I, I can game another day this week or, you know, that's fine. Let's just, let's just do that and keep people happy. Um, I can't do that anymore. You know, I gotta, I have to optimize my time. My every, every night that I'm not here with my family, uh, you know, my sons are, are, according to my wife, I don't know if, if uh, part of this might be just kind of her wanting me to stay home more, but I'm, I, I definitely think there's at least some degree of truth to it that, you know, my kids, my, especially my oldest boy, um, he, he has a hard time sometimes when I'm not home at night. So when I'm gaming at, in the evening, um, you know, I have to, I have to remain sensitive to that. And I don't want to be away from, I don't want to spend the, the, I, I, the thought of uh, spending the one night away for them, from them, uh, you know, teaching a couple of kids how to play Batman and they don't end up buying the game or anything like that. They just, uh, their parents just wanted them to burn a couple of hours and, and be entertained. Um, I, I, I can't do that anymore. I can't be that guy anymore, you know? Um, so even when I do run demos for, like, Guild Ball and all that kind of stuff, I, I have to be selective. It's like, you know, if you're, if you're just here to waste time or, you know, you just want a free game to get slotted out and have the, um, somebody else watch your kid for you, I can't do that anymore. Um, so, so yeah, getting the store staff involved is, is important because, um, you know, uh, they, they can do stuff like that, but more importantly, if I'm being completely raw with you guys, more importantly, they're getting paid to do it. You know what I mean? At least if they have to run Batman for a couple of nine-year-old kids, at least they're, they're getting paid. Like at least they that's a, a small consolation, but I do think that it that's important. It's important to kind of draw a line there and go, well, 
you know, ultimately my time is my time. Uh, there will always be someone younger that can take up the mantle. It's true. I've been wanting people to do that, actually. I want people in some some ways. I think I feel like I'm kind of in the way because I feel like I want other people to kind of step in and take up the mantle and all that kind of thing. But then some people say, "Oh well, you know, Octave's here, and he he's done that forever. Let's just let him do it. He's better at it." I get that. I'm not saying that that's true, but I hear that a lot. Well, you're better at it anyways. Why don't you go ahead and just you know take care of it? Um. So there, there's there's that factor. Um, and then even besides that, it's kind of like for the younger guys, uh, their struggle isn't, you know, they don't, it's not lack of time. They, got, they have way more time than I have. Um, their struggles are more like lack of, of focus or interest. And then they have resource problems, you know. Uh, I can't get a ride to the shop. Um, I... Uh, I don't own more than one team. Uh, I don't own my own terrain. Um, you know, that's been my uh, my experience with uh, with younger guys. Is when younger guys do it. I'm not saying that they do a bad job, but it's I've, it's it's been common to see uh, some of the younger guys uh, kind of struggle with getting getting the resources together to be reliable you know to be uh, to be on the store at the store on time to commit to dates to run events um, to be studied up on the rules and then to be uh, then there's the, the other factor too because um, there are people there are also other guys that, that like to teach people game demos. Like they want to they want to do game demos and they want to get more people into their game. But do I'm just like totally unfiltered tonight, so I'm just gonna say what I'm gonna say. Um, but they're not approachable people, or they're not they don't give a they don't give a, a good or positive experience teaching people the game. Uh, and it's not their fault. It could just be a core incompatibility like so for example um the yeah it is a lot of work thank you um for example uh in my experience it's always been you're if you're going to be a person who teaches people games or promotes games then um you can't you kind of have to gauge your your audience um, and then kind of you have to be flexible in terms of how different people learn or regard a game or approach a game. Um, and so it typically it's better to have somebody who is knowledgeable about a game but also casual in their approach to playing it. Um, you can be taught like it's not the same as like, uh, you know, I, I guess learning how to play the piano. Right. If you wanted to learn how to play the piano, or if you wanted to learn how to ride a bike, or, or, uh, or something of that nature, then it's totally appropriate to go. You, you know, if you had the the crazy amount of resources or uh, connections, it would be reasonable to go to, say, uh, you know, a, a famous uh, performer, a, a famous pianist, or a famous. Uh, um, cyclist or something like that like that's that's okay that's I, that's that's great if you can if you have the ability to do that it's not so much the same with gaming like you don't want to you don't necessarily want to the the best player uh the best guild ball player in the world to teach you how to play guild ball now i don't know who the best player guild ball player in the world is but what i'm saying is that person might be a jerk or they might just be totally um, unapproachable, and so they're not they're not good for teaching or promoting the game. They might also only think in terms of a competitive mindset, um, and that can be a turnoff. Like for example, when I was uh, trying to get into War Machine, uh, many times I tried to get into War Machine many times actually, and uh, the last one of the last 
memorable times, I tried to get into War Machine. Um, I attended a newbie event for War Hordes. This was during Mark II, so this was a while ago. Um, and, you know, I met the local press ganger, and I had my fully painted army, and there were veteran players there, and I was the only guy with the fully painted army, so that was funny. Um, and when we when he started to teach me how to play, we were he was teaching me how to play, um, he kind of got too into the weeds. You know, he kind of got too into the, well, if you do this, and you move this, and you do this, and you roll that, and you do this, and you do that, and you go here, and then you cast your kill. You know what I mean? He kind of walked me through... I was trying to play a game and trying to kind of learn, and I wanted to feel the flow of the game and all of that. And he did teach me stuff. Like, I was able to kind of glean a little bit of stuff from what he was saying, but um, but I didn't learn. I, I didn't think I walked away with what nearly as much as I could have, you know, if I were allowed to, to um, experience the game. Like, what I usually do if I'm uh, teaching someone how to play a game uh, and I see something really cool, what I do is I tell the person, like, look, I, there's this really cool thing I could show you. It's a little bit more advanced. Um, and if you want, I can walk you through it and show you how cool it is. Or if not, you know, feel your way around, play what you want to play, and I can show it to you later, right? And, and you know, it's about 50-50. A lot of times people are especially like the older, more casual guys are like, you know what, hold on to that thought. I don't want to learn that right now. I just want to learn how to run around and have fun with the game. And then occasionally you'll have other people that are like, no, show it to me right now. Um, so, um, so yeah, it, you, you do have to be, in my opinion, you, you do have to be, kind of have a, a more casual approach to teaching people the game. And you have to, in my opinion, again, you have to focus on big concepts when you're teaching a game. You don't, um, you don't go dive directly into the weeds. There are going to be some players that get that and appreciate that and really like that approach where you're directly in the weeds. Um, there are some people that when they learn games, like they want to learn the, the power combos right out of the gate so they can start winning at the game. Um, and, you know, that's not me personally, but I've had people like that that want to learn, uh, you know, they're like, okay, well, you know, don't worry about the big concepts. I want to know what do I take in my list. Uh, so you get stuff like that. Um, but I, I really think teaching people big concepts is more important. Um, like it, for a Guild Ball demo, if a player walks away and they don't know all the different things you can do with momentum, that's fine. But if they saw them and they, they, they're like, you know, I couldn't tell you exactly what you can do with momentum, but I saw like two or three different tricks during the demo. And so now I have an idea of what I can do with momentum. That's the goal. That's that's really it. If they're if they say, well, I don't remember everything on this particular player's card, but I remember what types of um, activities that character would get into uh, to try to fulfill their expected role on the on the pitch. That's more important. You know, that's that's more valuable. Who you can? What's more valuable for, um, for say Flint is not so much that you remember exactly what his playbook is, or uh, or all of his different character plays, or all of his different traits. What you should be able to do is walk away knowing, hey, if Flint is you know somewhere within sixteen to twenty four inches of the goal he's still a threat. <laughs> you know what I mean? Those are the kinds of, uh, those are the kinds of takeaways you want. Uh, so big concept, in my opinion, is, is what you, you should really be going for. Um, oh, wow. Tater has, uh, I was teaching Batman, uh, the other day 
to somebody who's not he's a nice he's a nice guy he's a fun guy i hope to, to play more games with him but it was just kind of an interesting thing like um uh, so i was teaching him how to play batman and he kept interrupting me i'm like okay well here's the overview the basic overview of an activation right you know you're going to activate a model you're probably going to do some kind of an advance you may do an attack you may do a special move right i was explaining it in those terms how to move around the board how to allocate your willpower um stuff like that he kept interrupting me and said well, what does this do what does this mean what does that do what does this do on all of the traits he just kept hammer like 20 30 40 questions he just kept doing that and finally i said to him like look dude we're gonna be here for an hour of just looking up keywords and traits and that's not you're not gonna learn how to play the game at all you're not gonna get it you know i liken that to and and i think where where he was coming from is he was here's a guy that was looking for like the power combo like the super powerful tricky thing that he can do because of a keyword on a card and yeah, you're going to want to know how to do that when you play the game, but not when you're learning how to play the game. That's um, I liken that to trying to, to teach someone how to drive a car by having them memorize what all the gauges on the dashboard tell them. You know, that's that's the problem. That's that's you being in the weeds and not um, uh, not focusing in on big concepts because that's. That's really how you, in my opinion, how you learn, uh, how the average person learns how to play a miniatures game is they learn the big concepts and then as they play more games, then they'll start to remember, oh, that's what Acrobat does. Oh, yeah, that that's what, uh, that's what Sturdy does. Um, and with Guild Ball, they may not remember that... Uh, Brick has a knockdown, a momentous knockdown on three results, but they'll remember. Oh, Brick is a guy who uh, who has a really nice counter charge, and um, you know, and he's he's got a he's got the ability to knock people down or push him around the pitch. That's all they really need to know, right? They they don't this whole memorizing things and and knowing all the the traits and the keywords and all that kind of stuff that just doesn't make sense from a learning experience you're gonna have plenty of time to to look all that up when you're building your list because that's what a lot of like like the really competitive or power gamer guys like to do is they want to learn the base mechanics of the game and then they're going to spend the next 24 to 72 hours looking for power combos on uh, on an army list builder or something like that, you know. Let me know in the comments if you think I'm I'm maybe being too harsh or too stereotypical. But that's been my experience with uh, with either you know power gamers or weedy gamers. Competitive gamer I think is is very different. You know, when I teach a competitive gamer how to play a game, they do want to learn big concept. In fact, competitive gamers like they're truly talented competitive gamers want to learn big concept because that means they when they do go back and they look up all the special traits and everything that they're going to be looking for traits along a certain theme right so for example uh, let's say i was teaching a competitive player how to play farmers um and you know and i say to him well farmers they tend to have um they tend to have big health tracks, but they don't have armor. Their defense is okay. They have okay to average defensive stats. Um, they don't rock a lot of armor. Uh, and not rocking armor, but having a decent health track, doesn't necessarily make you vulnerable to damage. It makes you vulnerable to, uh, to proct character plays, right? So you're not necessarily vulnerable to, you know, momentous four damage on a buffed character it's not necessarily that it's more um wow this this character being 2-0 tough hide i'm not gonna bother um i'm not gonna bother selecting a lot of damage results on them i just want to proc my singled out or i want to proc my thousand cuts 
Um, I want to proc uh, Fangtooth Unleashed or un. No, I got it right. Yeah, Fangtooth Unleashed on that. That's that's what I mean. That's what farmers are vulnerable to, and a a competitive player, a person who understands big concepts like that, if they're new to a game and they're going to play against farmers, they're going to be thinking about that and going, okay, well, I should take characters then who have some really, really nice, have access to some really, really nice character plays because um, I'll be able, against farmers, I should be able to take advantage of those character plays. Uh, so... For example, Union, um, Blackheart might be a fantastic player to field against a uh, farmer's team because Blackheart can proc a lot of really cool stuff off his playbook. Mallet's another guy. There's amazing, good, good, solid stuff on his playbook that he can proc off of farmers. That's what I'm getting at, right, is, um, is this idea that, that – uh, you learn big concept and you look for specific themes when you're building. Uh, and then this is more of the competitive mindset. They, I, I should, yeah, I should rephrase that. They look for um, more specific themes. And it, it, it makes more sense than those guys that are kind of looking for the one-off exploitable thing. And so they're going to keep asking you, oh, what does this keyword mean? What does this keyword mean? What does this keyword mean? I mean, in addition to that, it's not even just wasting our time like having me look up stuff, but he could look up the stuff himself. And at the very start of the demo, I was like, oh, okay, if you really want to look up, uh, if you really want to look up traits, special traits and characteristics and stuff, open up crits kill people at the start of the game. And I said that at the very start of the demo, like, do that if you're really more interested in learning all the little keywords. And he didn't. He just instead just kept firing, you know, question after question. What does this do? What does this do? Um, and I just think that's not a very good way to learn how to play a game. Um, it's, it's overall, though, it's his learning experience, not mine, if I'm teaching him how to play a game. And if he wants to learn how to play a game that way, I guess that's how he's going to do it. It just seems like way long, a much harder, a longer and harder road to try to string together wins when all you're doing is you're you're banking on your list and those characteristics to save you. I think that's a huge mistake. So this tater is actually wearing gloves. Tower loaded out is quite scary. So, so yeah, when you're when you're teaching a miniatures game, focus on big concepts. Don't be afraid to throw out layers of rules because it, it's just not appropriate at that time. You know what I mean? You're teaching somebody guild ba guild ball. You don't have to break out season three plots on the demo it doesn't that's just another wrinkle that, that they, they don't need to concentrate on at this time you want them to concentrate on um you know getting the the core mechanics down so you would throw plots out but i know teach his own i've i've talked with many other like game promoters that have a very different philosophy than me that like they want to teach they're competitive gamers themselves, so they want to teach uh, the players how to start winning right out of the gate. And they want to teach the players, oh, take this with this and this, and then you'll win. And I, I, I that's just not me. Like, I, 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 I don't appeal, that's not my appeal for playing miniatures games. And, um, and if it's theirs, that's fine. I don't want to, I'm not trying to judge them over it. I just don't think it's. Um, I don't think that's the, the most uh, appealing, the most broadly appealing way to teach someone how to play a miniatures game. I mean, if anything, when you're teaching somebody how to play a miniatures game, what you're banking on is a lot of aesthetic things that you may not have control of, the quality of the miniatures. 
You might be um, banking on the quality of the miniatures. You might be banking on the rule set itself. Uh, you're you're banking on stuff like that. Your own personal um, part of the cell, and don't and, and let's not make any mis uh, mistakes here. When you are teaching someone a, a miniatures game, you are part of the end product, like it or not. Um, if you're teaching a local player how to play one of the games that you play, well, guess what? You're part of the product. You know, part of selling them that experience is giving them some idea what it's going to be like playing against some of the players in the community, aka you. Right? So if you're a fun person to get a game demo from, and people enjoy playing those demos with you, then they walk away with the idea that you're a fun player and that that's another reason to get into the game. It's like, oh, well, I liked, uh, you know, I liked how Sean taught me how to play the game. So, uh, so I'm going to buy the game. And part of my, part of my pros for buying the game is the fact that Sean, the guy who taught me how to play, is also playing, and I had so much fun gaming with him that it'll be fun for us to have a, a game that we can play together. So make no mistake, you are part, when you're demoing a game to somebody, you're part of the product. If you are, you know, if we're talking local, teach someone how to play a game at your local shop. So, you know, if you have a, if you have a, a repulsive person, um, teaching people how to play the game, um, then I don't think your odds for success are going to be very high. I just, I don't think that is going to pan out very well. Okay. So we almost have the this guy blocked out entirely. So now we're going to... I'm going to start to move towards um, uh, move towards getting him dry brushed and highlighted. I try. Yeah, but yeah, it's true. Who you send in to do the game demo is super important. The game is, and not everyone agrees with me here. Some people think that, hey, if it's a good game, it'll sell itself. People will like it anyway. And that is also true. Like, I've taught people how to play games, and I don't, at least the impression I got from them, is they, they didn't necessarily care for me all that much, but they liked the game, and they asked the relevant questions about the game. And um, so... It worked out. They got what they they got what they wanted, even though they didn't necessarily like me in the game demo. They ended up playing anyway, and you know, in those cases, they just don't they don't game with you. It's like, oh, I'll buy a copy, and I'll game with people I like. <laughs> and you know, sometimes that can be if you if you take it seri if you take it personally, that can be bad. Like, don't. So don't uh, try not to take it too personally. If if people are saying, "Oh well, I want to, I'm going to buy the game, but we're not, I'm not going to play in your events." That's just that's just what happens, man. So okay, we are actually moving along pretty quick, believe it or not. I'm going to do a a rough cut dry brush. On the mini. I'm gonna just spread it out. Tater's awesome. A lot of the times. If you have a person that loves the game and they can give you answers that don't go into detail how great you can win with a certain army. Yeah. They, if they can 
reasonably describe all the factions and help you pick one and then also teach you some of the the key concepts of a game it's a good person to um to run a game demo but you know for me most of those days for me are over i'm just not not i, I don't have the bandwidth to do that Okay, so now, um, actually, I need, I want to do a little highlight on the hair. And then we're going to start washing this bad boy. Oh, I'm going to do more soil stuff too. Ooh, a little too much going on there. Okay. Let's wash the flesh. This is why I have Scarecrow Group. <laughs> I'm doing all flesh wash here. That's actually way too much flesh wash. Okay. Move it. Okay. So now let's do a, let's do kind of a, um, I guess we'll do like an umber wash. A little bit of brown, a little bit of black. It's a glaze medium. But yeah, I I'm now hooked on this idea that if people if stores ask me to do stuff for them, I'm cool. I'll I'll do it. You know, I'll give up some time. To, to do an event for them, but I'm going to ask them to get, to partner me up with a store staff that can pick up the slack, you know, that, that I don't have to be the guy all the time. And I think that's, I think that's pretty reasonable. Just painting in the branches and stuff. Truth be told, and I think Guild Ball is my favorite game. You know, it, it, it was for me for, for a while. Um, right now, it's definitely amongst my top games, but I don't know that, um, I don't know that it surpasses uh, Batman. And then right now, uh, Relic Knights is also on hold, so so it's kind of hard to say. What am I doing? I should have just done the gloss wash from, uh, oh well. This is just as good. Like the gloss uh, Agrax Earth Shade, this is just as good though. In fact, it's if anything, it's better because it's a little bit easier to control. The only thing I really lose here, doing this is, um, I lose that some of that glossiness that you get from the Agrax Earth Shade gloss. 
Next will be Blood and Plunder. Oh, nice. The theme for Blood and Plunder just looks amazing. And they have some of the minis at uh, CQ. So now I'm going to take off a bunch of this ink glaze. pretty good looking pretty sharp there so he will definitely match the other uh, the other farmers that we sold Hey, what's up, Jam Jar? Good night, Albert. Thanks for tuning in. Catch you on the next one, man. All right. So I'm just going to continue that with Tater's uh, base. To getting most of that off with the highlight. He's looking pretty awesome. Super, super fun model to paint. Let's do, uh, we're going to do some armor wash on the sickle. What game set is this? This is a uh, Tater from, oh, wrong ink. This is Tater from the uh, Guild Ball, from the Guild, from the game Guild Ball. Um, Tater is, I believe, he's still kind of a limited edition uh, miniature. But yeah, he's a lot of fun. This guy has a crazy, crazy rule set too. Like. I don't know if you've run into him recently, Sean, but Tater is ridiculous. His his knockdown, he's got easily the best knockdown in the game, in my opinion. I mean, it's like it. I, I think his knockdown is more like um, um, Stave's uh, throw keg but way more controllable, like way more precise. I mean, man, he's he's already looking quite good. Does not need much help at all, really. Kind of getting where he needs to be. Let's do. Uh, Okay, let's just let's give him a little bit of definition in his hair. I haven't bought him yet, but the model's now my girlfriend, so I'm going to be painting him. Cool. 
He's a pretty straightforward paint. That's good, right? Not a whole lot to worry about with uh, with Tater. I'm just going to give him a little bit of highlight in the skin. Make the features kind of more prominent. He's supposed to be quite handsome. So why not, right? There you go. You're painting your own whooping stick. That's funny. Okay. Uh, I don't know if that's the color I was going for, but that's fine. I'm going to just give him a little bit more of a highlight on his upper shirt. And it an effort to get a little more brightness on the model. And meanwhile, I want to Get more of a edge down there. Let's do a soft edge in the sickle. There we go. There we go. All right. Well, let's paint the base. Oops. <clears throat> the real trick is going to be to figure out how I can seal this guy and get him over to the client tomorrow in time for game night. Did I paint this base the proper color? I hope so. I really hope so. We'll find out soon enough, won't we? I mean, the other option I think was, no, this looks too red. This can't be the right color. I think the right color is that earth color. I'm going to have to go back and watch my video or look at my, I'm going to have to look at my photo, the photo I took of the farmers. Did I use that color brown? I just don't, I don't remember. Hold on. Let's see. Do, do, do. And then look right. I think I used a, a brown that had a little more gray to it. Hmm. Did I use? I don't use chocolate. Brown, did I? This seems too dark. Chocolate brown. Chocolate brown. I could have used chocolate brown. Why is that taking so long to dry, too? It's the other. Yeah, it looks like I did use chocolate brown. That's the right color. Okay, well, let's let it dry, and then I'll paint the chocolate brown in. Whoa. It's just so wet on the, on the surface there. I'll give that a minute. In fact, what I can do while that's still drying is I can go ahead and paint, uh, put the tuft in. We'll put a, a tuft I need to help kind of unify the look of the model. 
if I can find my cuffs. That I had. I stuck my whole sheet of them in here. But maybe not. Flowers. Okay. Well, where did I do with that? flowers. Good thing that base is still drying. Oh, man. Sorry, viewers. I know this is not the most riveting stuff. I struggle to find. My scenic base accessory. You know, I specifically remember having the full sheet of them the other night and throwing them in my drawer. I threw them in this drawer. At least that's how I remember it. I threw them in here. Maybe I threw them in here. This doesn't make sense that I would throw them in there. Yeah, who knows? Still throw them here? No. Okay. Yeah, people have tuned out. So if you're you're going to bed, I guess that's it. <laughs> I don't blame you. I'm uh yeah. I'm like stuck here. That's just absolutely wild to me. Then I don't have. Then all of those tufts, I had a whole sheet of them. And I had them out, and I used them last night. And then I put them there. I don't know. I think, you know, I just did that dry to the right color. Looks like it kind of did. Is it the right color? Not find anything here anymore. It's just too messy, even with the. Yeah, that is the right color. Okay, let's just paint a second coat of it on then. Let's do that. Let's paint the second coat on, and then we'll. As it's drying down, I'll put the paints away and see if we can find, or see if those tufts show up. It's just crazy that they're not, that I can't see them immediately. Okay. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah, let's start. Let's start putting the paints away, and maybe it'll show up. I mean, the blue's still here from the other night. So that's going, we got that going for us, which is nice. And let's get all these up and out off the, off the table there. Here's how he's looking. He's looking pretty good, actually. Oh. I'm dry. I'm going to have to seal him tomorrow morning. telling you it's gotta be those tufts have to be in this drawer that like I I almost distinctly remember sticking it in there and at this time I don't think the babysitter walked off with them <laughs> I don't think the babysitter uh, unless she's doing who knows maybe she she does commission painting and she needed grass tufts to finish her project. That's wild. That is totally not in there. Except that it was totally in there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, man. How, how ridiculous. Okay. <laughs> so there's that. <laughs> Why do you guys watch this show, honestly? <laughs> Um, okay. A little spot of blue right there. Whoa! Whoa, buddy. Here we go. Have a good night. I do what I want, Octave. <laughs> What's up? Man. Okay. So there's Tater. I don't know. He's he's looking pretty good. I could do more details on him, but I think he's I think he looks pretty good. I could do a couple more highlights on him. I don't know. I think he's good. I'm just going to keep waffling back and forth like that. I could have done a more white shirt, but that matches the rest of the guild as I, as I had painted it. Anything else I could do to this guy? Give him a little... I don't know. He just, in the farmer colors, he just looks so bland, I guess is the word I'm looking for. He just looks kind of bland. He's cool. All caught up on Voltron now. That's right. I also am caught up on Voltron. I was super stoked, too, this past uh, season because we had Sven. But I, I hope that they explain that Sven... Because if they're gonna if they're gonna have that alternate universe where there's a Sven instead of a Shiro, um, they need to have Sven um, like freeing all these worlds. Because Sven frees up dozens of worlds in in the original Voltron series, and it, it's part of my reason why he was like the funniest character to me. Because like so they have Sven, and he he was originally Blue Lion. And then he gets injured, and Princess steps in for him. And uh, then at the end of the of the series, Sven comes back, and he was like, "Oh, I freed all these worlds." And uh, Voltron freed maybe like 
we'll call it two dozen worlds, but I'm pretty sure Sven freed more worlds not being a part of Voltron than Voltron did. And that's super funny. Season three finale was so freaking good. Yeah, it, it, it's a pretty good show, I gotta admit. It's a pretty good show. Anyways, yeah, I do like Sven. And man, it's it's too bad you didn't come on Tuesday, dude, because you this could have been yours. This model could have been yours. But it's okay. It's Andrews. And you know, um we have right now we have uh a pretty cool like uh core group built up around um Batman and Guild Ball. And we're trying to get some cross pollination. You know, we want to get some of the uh, Batman guys to pick up Guild Ball teams. We want to get the Guild Ball guys to try out Batman. So, because to me, it's a it's a great pairing of games. Nice, nice pairing for for two games. Okay, well, I guess there's nothing to do left to do now but just let this guy dry and uh, seal him up and bring him to my client tomorrow. So. Anyways, that's going to do it for this video. Yeah, hit me up later, Kevin. Let's see if we can get some some games going or, like, arrange a meetup or something. Uh, yeah. So, anyways, yeah, that's going to do it for this video. want to thank everybody for watching. Have a good night, guys, and we'll catch you on the next one.